A very good afternoon to all our participants today. Uh, welcome to another edition of RDS, RDS Thursday webinar. Uh, I am your moderator today. Uh, my name is Kenny. And uh, together with me, the, the speaker for the topic today entitled, The Role That Lawyers Play in Enhancing a Successful Mediation, uh, our litigation partner, Mr. Rishi, uh, who will be the main speaker for the topic today. Uh, just a little bit of introduction uh, about Mr. Rishi. Uh, Rishi has a diverse range of corporate clients, including financial institutions, leading audit firms, newspapers, multinationals, and listed companies. Uh, additionally, Rishi also regularly represents clients before domestic and international arbitral tribunals. Uh, Rishi has appeared at all levels of Malaysian civil courts, focusing primarily on corporate and shareholder disputes, defamation and arbitration. Uh, Rishi sub-specializes in corporate fraud, where he is currently involved in a number of suits relating to the 1MDB matters, mainly against International Petroleum Investment Company, or known as IPIC, and ABA Investment BJS. He is also the former secretary of the Malaysian Middle Temple Al Alumni Association, and he was a contributing author of the Malaysian White Book on Civil Procedure, uh, for the editions of 2013, 2015, and 2018, right? Uh, just a little bit of brief uh, note about the, the topic that we're going to discuss today, mediation. Uh, it, it is one of the most uh, practiced uh, tool uh, for settlement of disputes uh, out of court, but perhaps it is also one of the least uh, understood, you know? So I, I think it's in the benefit of all practitioners to revise, if not refresh, uh, the understanding of mediation as a very practical uh, time-saving tool to resolve disputes out of court, all right? Uh, Rishi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny, for uh, a very uh, generous introduction um, and a, a brief mention about the topic today. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. and. Uh, thank you for taking time off to join us today uh, for what uh, we have lined up for you. Um, quite an interesting insight in so far as perspective on mediation is concerned. Um, how we have sequenced uh, the talk today, uh, we'll be touching on four uh, aspects, mainly the third one is what I, I, I hope to get to quicker than the others. Uh, firstly, is uh, in understanding mediation. Um, why should one mediate? How can lawyers enhance the prospects of uh, mediation and uh, the way forward uh, where we would touch uh, on, on some aspects of the future of mediation, how uh, I, I perceive that it is an area that is likely to, to be given uh, better attention as a method of uh, resolving disputes. So without further ado, um, let us go into understanding mediation. As mentioned, Kenny, Kenny stated, uh, has stated, mediation provides an alternative method of moving and settling disputes. It can stimulate an earlier and more acceptable resolution to many disputes. Volumes of disputes arise, um, or the volumes of disputes which exist today, uh, given post-pandemic circumstances, are quite colossal uh, in such a situation. And you, you will find that even in our courts, um, that there is a move towards considering alternative methods of resolving disputes. And mediation is one of the alternative methods of resolving disputes, which does not impair or violate the adversarial process and often can be the only one uh, procedure to resolve a matter without complete risk untold expenses, hidden expenses, and time consumption. So in understanding mediation, uh, we ought to have a brief mention about where it all began. When, when, it, when it began in 1960s, mediation was considered a reaction to the legal industry offering clients more control and less cost insofar as dispute resolution is concerned. Um, it, did not have the respect of the lawyers then so far as a, a method or, or forum uh, for resolving disputes is concerned. It was just developed uh, as an alternative. Um, 
today there is a while it is not permeated as as uh, much as it should be just yet, but there is a movement and you will find that lawyers who support mediation tend to be more effective lawyers in so far as uh, the, the lens of commercial parties are concerned, because they tend to be more solution driven. In, ad in addition to the mediation process, mediation as a whole, when you look at it as a process, um, another thing that needs to be broached when it comes to understanding mediation is the role of the mediator, how it began and how it has grown over the years. The role of the mediator is very uh, different from that of a traditional arbiter, because uh, unlike uh, litigation or arbitration, there is no decision making by the mediator. Uh, the mediator's role, like the mediation process, is an extremely important element in the handling of the mediation. Um, there are prerequisites in, in understanding the, that role, the importance of the role of the mediator, um, that being neutrality of the uh, mediator. The mediator's uh, behavior is uh, impartial, he is a neutral third party. He's neither a representative nor an agent of the parties in the dispute. That being said, while he is neutral, uh, he has to emphasize and highlight the individual responsibility of parties to a dispute. They must express the individual, parties must express the individual responsibility. And uh, it is the mediator's responsibility to ensure that each party stands up for himself or herself. And then you have the aspect of uh, the prerequisite being mutual fairness. Uh, the objective of the mediation process is for parties to reach an agreement that they each believe is mutually fair. For if it is not, very simply, when you go back uh, to either report on a situation or, or you go back to rethink uh, a position, you will feel that this is not the outcome that you wanted to achieve or you are comfortable with. So mutual fairness is always one of the prerequisites. Um, there is another aspect in so far as understanding mediation is concerned, but that is uh, the role of lawyers. And I will be going more into that later when we are discussing how uh, lawyers can enhance the prospects of mediation. When we go into discussing why should one mediate? Now, very simply, mediation, uh, is an alternative which has different features in so far as the methodology of seeking to resolve the dispute is concerned. Its uh, features or its impact or consequences are also very different from your traditional methods of resolving a dispute. Um, it, you know, in, in so far as the main advantages are concerned, it is informal. Uh, details or, of what is discussed during mediation naturally is confidential. It is quick and inexpensive, and actually uh, the quick and inexpensive part uh, tends to be downplayed in so far as a, a, a massive advantage is concerned. And that, uh, I would say, is because it's not highlighted in the highest intensity it should be by lawyers, uh, and we will come to that later. And the other aspect in so far as what mediation uh, promotes uh, as opposed to traditional uh, dispute resolution uh, methods such as litigation or arbitration. It has a greater degree of party control. Parties who negotiate their own settlements have more control over the outcome of their dispute. Parties have an equal say in the process. There is no determination of fault, but rather the parties reach a mutually agreeable resolution to their conflict. So there is no uh, right or wrong application of the law per se. So this is very important to understand as an advantage. Preservation of relationships. Commercial parties who are at loggerheads, who are in dispute, um, tend to be invested in the dispute. And uh, more often than not, um, be clouded or, or forget uh, the need to preserve commercial relationships, the, the sustainability that that will bring, the benefits that that will bring in so far as the business is concerned. 
and uh, mediation offers that, uh, that that is one of the major advantages you a mediated settlements that address all parties' interests often preserve relationships in ways that would not be possible in a win-lose decision-making procedure such as litigation or dispute resolution. Um, the other advantages or the, the, the other things that it, it, it promotes would be um, comprehensive and customized agreements. Mediated agreements often help resolve procedural and interpersonal issues that are not necessarily susceptible to legal determination. Uh, lawyers would know certain things don't fall within the purview of an issue, then it's not determined. But more often than not, the party would, uh, uh, would have expected, would have hoped for that to be addressed. You know? So uh, the parties can tailor their settlement to the to their particular situation and attend to the fine details of implementation. Now, the other advantage before I move on to how can lawyers enhance um, mediation uh, is this, which should be the key takeaway: is that even if a, a uh, litigant or disputant uh, does not resolve the dispute. Mediation frequently brings out the real issues and, and, and allows for enhanced communications between parties uh, uh, and, and on occasion lawyers to foster an improved, uh, improved prospect in terms of reaching a settlement, an improved prospect in terms of managing a case because everything is unearthed. Um, in a way that you can deal with uh, what is the fundamental aspect of the dispute. Moving on, we go on to touch about how can lawyers enhance the prospects of a mediation. Now, before we understand how, uh, it is important to understand the extent of the role of the lawyer insofar as mediation, the mediation process and mediation is concerned. Um, we, well, as lawyers, if I'm speaking to lawyers, I need not say there is nothing mandatory uh, insofar as uh, legal representation is concerned in a mediation. Technically, the lawyer does not need to be present at all. You know? uh, however, more often than not, uh, a lawyer tends, the parties tend to seek advice of the lawyer insofar as mediation is concerned. Um, and a lawyer may be involved in a variety of ways. His role, his or her role, does not differ in either voluntary mediation or mandatory mediation. He may give, sub, uh, he may give advice on the subject of engaging in mediation as a mechanism to resolve the conflict or dispute at hand. Or he could be told by the client that the client desires to mediate with his present, with his or her present all throughout. So in understanding and, and, and the, the quote that, that has been cited here uh, could not be uh, further from the truth. The true function of a lawyer is to unite parties driven uh, asunder. A dispute is a problem to be solved together rather than a combat to be won. Um, later, when we talk about uh, oh, you know, moving forward in so far as enhancing uh, mediation as a prospect is concerned. Uh, we will also be touching upon and, and understand a bit on uh, what is the dilemma in so far as uh, lawyers not enhancing, or why are lawyers not enhancing the prospects of a mediation? Uh, it is because of uh, the underlying mindset issue uh, in so far as treating mediation is concerned. Lawyers tend to uh, hold on uh, deeply to philosophical aspects of the adversarial system. So they are combative in nature and mediation is not uh, understood in the manner in which it should be, uh, to be used as a tool for res resolution. Uh, and, and that is where the disconnect is. So uh, we have other, other um, aspects uh, of uh, it, pointers uh, which, which purport to explain the purpose of uh, mediation uh, that in relation to mediators uh, and lawyers mediating, 
uh, i.e. they are not gladiators, they are meant to be problem solvers. Um, both parties, mediator and lawyers, uh, and a famous American jurist uh, by the name of Scully once said, and, is, and has a very instructive textbook in this. We are coaching, giving the client tools they need and helping secure the preparation they need to speak for themselves and participate effectively on their own behalf. We need to have the attitude that a mutually agreeable stipulated result is going to be cheaper for them and is more likely to stick. Lawyers, practicing lawyers and commercial parties who have been litigants will understand that more often than not, leave the commercial uh, party aside, leave the litigant who is expectedly the commercial party. And I'm, of course, you'd expect me to talk about commercial parties more because I am a commercial dispute resolution a lawyer. Mediation also involves a lot of parties uh, uh, resolving their family disputes. So you will have to excuse me that I am actually uh, narrowing it slightly insofar as commercial disputes are concerned. Employment disputes also tend to get mediated. So more, more often than not, when lawyers, commercial parties will realize when the lawyer individually or your opponent lacks the notion or will to uh, participate and uh, treat mediation uh, in a meaningful uh, way or to treat mediation in, uh, uh, in the manner it should be in a meaningful way for purposes of resolving the dispute, mediation more often than not uh, would not succeed simply because the participation was not genuine, you know. Um, and, and that is sad uh, because if approached in a manner, uh, as I will go through later uh, on a checklist basis, whether or not uh, the outcome of settlement is achieved, um, one is almost assured of benefits coming out of the process of mediation to know where parties stand, what is the actual position on the dispute, even if the other part, the other side of the opponent is being absolutely difficult, you would actually know that and to what extent, you know. Okay, so insofar as enhancing uh, prospects are concerned, and I just mentioned um, how can or how do lawyers enhance a successful mediation? My method has always been to adopt a checklist style as a layered guide because mediation involves strategy and strategy uh, insofar as mediation, the purview of mediation is concerned to my mind after revising, adopting a few other things. It has come down to these main uh, pointers. But even in so far as uh, successful negotiation, uh, that I have uh, all successful negotiation, which led to uh, settlement through mediation. Uh, I find that there is a pattern in so far as uh, being prepared in so far as facts and laws, uh, the facts and law is concerned when you're going in for the mediation, being open and candid about uh, the details or the purview of the dispute where it, where it stood at, being absolutely patient throughout the, the process of mediation. And patience is not a, a simplistic understanding. Uh, as litigation lawyers, lawyers tend to lack uh, the patience required. Uh, and much of that has got to do with the lack of understanding of what is the kind of patience required for a mediation process. Um, law, lawyers tend to uh, rush situations simply because it's a convergence of uh, factors, i.e. they have not allowed uh, enough uh, their credence given on their part to allow uh, their mind to say, you know, perhaps this, this mediation could have prospects of success. Let us give it a go. So with a preconceived uh, conclusion, 
uh, that these parties are very far apart. It's unlikely to even get anywhere in mediation. Let us just go through the process. Um, you would realize that there is an absence of patience from the onset, and that it in itself, uh, disposition-wise, is going to affect any prospects for a mediation. Whether or not a mediation is going to be successful, pursuant to your experience, likely to be even correct to say that that mediation is not going to be successful. The mere uh, fact that these patterns, which I just mentioned, i.e. preparedness, openness, uh, being genuine, forthright, patience, and uh, uh, adopting a disposition of willingness to compromise. If all of these are not there present from the start, then um, before moving on to other aspects of what had transpired during the mediation, one should actually uh, tell themselves as a lawyer that you had contributed to uh, the, the mediation not being a success. And the idea of a mediation being a success is not to be seen as the mediation being a success in itself, but the takeaways from that and how it, that calls for landing in so far as the dispute is concerned as a whole. So that is another important aspect to see as well. So now going into the uh, points for you know, this, this is a checklist and guide in so far as how you could enhance, you know, I'm just using the words very, very carefully, enhance uh, the uh, prospects of mediation. It's not even a successful mediation. It's how do lawyers enhance a pros the prospects of a mediation? Um, the first thing I have listed there is initiation. Uh, I have mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, it just goes into uh, understanding that if you have mediation at the back of your mind from the get-go and not use it as a tool, where, as and when it's ar it arises or when uh, the court prompts you to do so, and, and, and as we know, lawyers, uh, lawyers would know now, commercial parties would know now, uh, there are instances in which a judge is given leeway to um, compel mediation before the judge, simply because of backlog. You know? So initiation ought to happen um before the the later stage you know uh if uh, you were to ask me for the main reason why people are reluctant to mediate it would be the perception that the parties are too far apart or it would be a waste of time because the other side is so unreasonable but these are not necessarily the case if two sides were older, able to settle the case on their own it's precisely because they are so far apart that they need intervention of a mediation. You know, when numbers are put on the table and when you are discussing the nature of the dispute or what is it, the crux of the dispute, the plank of the case, the initial offers from both sides would, you know, would lie, would, would, would be uh, quite far apart, no doubt. But the trick is to keep talking because the longer the parties take uh, uh, time to go through the process, the longer the parties talk, the closer they will usually get to a solution. And this is from experience. The, the, the next thing would be the timing. Uh, the timing of uh, when one should actually choose to uh, mediate. You see, in a perfect world, parties would agree to mediate as soon as after the dispute arose. Uh, sometimes in certain contracts, they are forced mediation. Um, and, and more often than not, we will hear that mediation in so far as uh, contractual clauses are concerned, uh, don't get anywhere. In the real world, in the real world, parties often tend or often inclined to do the opposite and wait until the eve of trial. <coughs> Concessions can often be obtained when the other side is faced with a deadline. For most litigants, the deadline does not occur until they are faced with going to trial. Every trial going lawyer would know this. The, the behavior and disposition of their clients uh, right before, and even one day before the eve of trial, 
uh, is very different. Uh, they are they are they are brave. They are bold. They want to take on anything. But when it is the eve of trial, when they realize they're going to be put on the stand, even the most uh, courageous ones tend to falter. Uh, tend to then be more amenable to to discuss uh, a settlement. You know? So because most people want to avoid the uncertainty of trial and as they get closer to the moment of truth, they become more inclined towards compromise. Um, people tend to downplay mediation before that, but that's not necessarily the case, as I, I have explained and, and how I will I'll be going through as well in, in pre-mediation pursuits. Um, it, it, the, the, the intertwined uh, position or the intertwined point is that if the lawyer actually has mediation as a tool, as a, as a purpose for a strategy um, insofar as resolving the dispute from the beginning or the get-go is concerned, uh, we do not have to uh, resort to this uh, simple uh, or, or tried and tested psychology of waiting for the eve of trial. Yeah. So an early mediation can be an opportunity for the plaintiff to reconsider an ill-advised suit, for example. Or if it is a thin case, the plaintiff may want to settle before a lot of time and expense has been put into the dispute. So, and, and, and timing for mediation and goes into pre-mediation pursuits as well, um, is about having to talk to your opposing counsel. If you're wondering whether it is the right time to mediate, the best way to find out is probably to talk to your opposing counsel. Find out if he or she feels that the case is ready to settle and the reasons why or why not can also be helpful to have the mediator talk uh, it depends in, the, in, in so far as private mediations are concerned uh, on occasion, you could get the mediator to talk confidentially with both sides in advance to find out if they are ready to resolve the case. Okay, uh, then is choice of mediator. Now, in Malaysia, when it comes to, liti um, uh, in, in, when it comes to litigation, it is not uh, easy to have a situation uh, where you choose your mediator. Uh, when it comes to the Malaysian Mediation Center, it often is the case that some uh, registrar is assigned or, or some judge is assigned, and more often than not, it's the presiding judge who has uh, a list of other judges who are amenable to mediate their matters. Um, a request may be put, um, and it should be, a uh, choice of mediator when it comes to foreign uh, jurisdictions, when I, I have looked at it. Um, it, it matters a lot because uh, it essentially goes into uh, two things. One is the familiarity with the area in which you are seeking the mediator to mediate for uh, the empathy, the empathy which comes through someone who is familiar with the area will go a long way uh, during the caucuses uh, in and during me mediation. Uh, I speak from uh, experience when I handled the mediation in Singapore um, and uh, the experience was uh, not pleasant simply because uh, who the, the mediator who was assigned um, did not have familiarity with the subject. It was a, a gold bullion uh, dispute. Um, it required knowledge insofar as fluctuating gold prices are concerned, uh, logistics insofar as that commodity is concerned. But what we were assigned were two senior runner lawyers or uh, running down practitioners. Um, to handle the matter uh, and uh, they, to my mind, botched the entire process uh, by failing to uh, understand um, this, these fine, finite nuances of the, the, the dispute. Nothing against running down lawyers uh, at all, uh, but it, in, when it came to that situation, it was something that they were uh, not prepared to handle, yet chose to, and the outcome was uh, something which to my mind could have been different. And then the other aspect of uh, having to look into uh, choosing your mediator, of course, uh, here we are saying that one, what we should move towards the culture of choosing your mediator, and by that maybe a proposition 
uh, uh, with substantiation as to why you consider a particular judge ought to mediate a matter. And it could be something which is easier or easily achieved if uh, two parties are uh, coming to make that proposition uh, mutually, uh, you know, in a collective manner. Next, we have uh, pre-mediation pursuits. Well, pre-mediation pursuits, it simply is, uh, again, it goes into uh, what are the things that you would like to uh, discuss uh, when you reach out to your opposing counsel, for example, when you are uh, uh, testing the waters with your clients of us considering mediation is concerned. Um, it, it, it is the understanding uh, when it comes to clients, for example, uh, that the individual with, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have to set aside an adequate time to complete the mediation. This is, of course, when you're discussing with your counsel, uh, you have to prepare your clients, you have to prepare uh, to make a convincing presentation in the joint session during mediation. You talk about the process itself so that everyone will be comfortable with how it will be conducted. And pre-mediation pursuits would also entail having to uh, conduct your own assessment. Uh, and I, I call this as a, uh, um, a comprehensive uh, assessment guide internally done by yourself in so far as weighing the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses in so far as pursuing mediation. Um, it serves as a, a useful reference point because uh, more often than not, when it, depending on the size of the dispute, and uh, when the dispute is, is, is uh, rife with various issues, connecting issues, for, the, for example, it's always useful to have that uh, docket with you every time as a reference guide. Allocation of time, I've touched on this. Uh, again, it goes into when I was talking about patients, um, the couple of hours approach is usually not realistic at all. Uh, it always is the case when it comes to lawyers, and we are talking about here, how do lawyers enhance uh, prospects of a, a, a mediation? Uh, lawyers tend to, depending on where, where you stood, lawyers tend to, where you stood in so far as understanding the prospects of a mediation. Lawyers tend to downplay um, the, the time required and, and it's always uh, opposite, opposite ends. I mean, so if you if you thought that there was no prospects, you just felt like, okay, um, you know, a few hours and we will be done. Uh, and if you thought that, you know, there are quite a few issues and let's keep mediation go, um, you probably think that it, it took more uh, time than required. Um, the simple rule of thumb should be that if it is set for mediation by right, you should block out the entire day uh, and that would mean that your, your mindset is moving towards the right uh, direction so far as treating mediation is concerned. Um, yeah, so uh, if you said that, it, if you, in your mind, you thought that the issues are simple, it is straightforward, uh, but told yourself, nonetheless, I'm going to say this whole day for mediation. Um, and uh, speaking from personal experience, uh, you'd be surprised how uh, the outcome uh, may be different. And, uh, and, and I think out of 10 lawyers I speak, uh, uh, almost all 10, uh, 10 lawyers who do litigation, commercial dispute litigation, will have at least a story in which they were thoroughly shocked or surprised uh, that the matter got mediated the way it did and uh, achieved settlement. So there we are, uh, actually, uh, the prospects of medi mediating a matter uh, are actually inherent and we should detach ourselves as lawyers, um, our prejudices, our perception, our viewpoints and things and uh, go through the process as if it, uh, we are doing it clinically as a surgeon. We may be surprised with the outcome that we may achieve. Okay, that is in so far as uh, allocation of time is concerned. Next up, uh, padding your client. Now, 
the other difficulty, no doubt, and of course, here, uh, when one speaks about the role of lawyers in enhancing a successful mediation, uh, if the client does not have any intention to mediate whatsoever, and more often than not, when they are emotionally involved or invested in a, in a dispute, that is the case. Um, we tend to also get discouraged, perhaps subconsciously, without realizing, um, you know, because of the disposition maintained by the client or what we expect that a uh, adversaries in an adversarial system in a dispute would tend to do. Um, again, we have to take a step back and still give it a go. Um, and, and one such way of doing it is uh, while you test the waters, um, and uh, while you test the waters with your client, uh, while you perhaps uh, uh, try and, and massage the idea of uh, mediation through the fact that this is a court ordered mediation, uh, either way, uh, there, there are significant things um, that you would have to uh, embark upon, you'd have to do, you'd have to broach in terms of discussion, in terms of uh, as if it was an exercise, um, in, in, in padding your client. Now, um, there is no there is no uh, ethical issue in so far as uh, witness coaching is concerned, uh, in so far as mediation is concerned. Uh, but uh, when you are padding your client, i.e., when you're explaining your client, explaining to your client about mediation prospects, uh, what it is all about, uh, it goes back to having to have the right uh, notion. Uh, when you are doing so, uh, because uh, there are ethical issues one could, you know, either tiptoe around in making it seem as if uh, this was just a process which existed uh, and one ought to go through the motions, but no obligation upon you to participate in a meaningful way whatsoever. More often than not, we hear that, uh, we hear that of lawyers doing that. More often than not, when you see uh, opponents, more often than not, we may have been guilty of that, to, to, to make an honest reflection of, of things. Um, and when that is the case, that, that goes into the, the inherent problem, you know. So padding your client, so what are the things that you ought to make them understand? Um, few key pointers, uh, the mediator's role, i.e. the mediator's role is neutral. And more often than not, the perception is that they're going there to tell the mediator a story as if it mattered that the mediator, who the mediator sided. So when you are padding your client, this is, these are the explanations that you're giving your client. You're actually making them understand that it is not the, the uh, rubrics or, or the dynamics that they may have uh, or they are probably uh, aware of. And it is easy to understand the adversarial process. I say, I go before the, the court and a judge, the court and the judge decides, you fight my case, you argue my case, the court decides. It's not that. So they need to understand that you're actually trying to convince the other side, you're appealing to the other side to achieve a resolution without having to go through combat. You know, they need to understand the depth of that. Yeah. So uh, the other things would be, do not expect the, the mediator to evaluate the case. You know, mediators typically know less about the case than the parties do. And they are just facilitators, you know. Um, and also, uh, while well, this is uh, very difficult, granted, easier said than done, what is the, the, the uh, practical translation to this? We all know sometimes as lawyers, um, but we ought to still explain to our clients that when we are trying to give mediation uh, at least a glimmer of hope, um, people tend to react and, uh, and, and be more accepting and more, more welcoming to people who are courteous and, and generous uh, in trying to resolve a dispute. So when you are, what, what that means is, is not so much an on the surface statement, it is more of trying to relate with the language of what the dispute is beforehand in terms of numbers. Uh, is it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the reputation that you're trying to, to uh, save, so on and so forth. It could be a myriad of issues, you know. So you, it, it needs to be explained to the client that they must give the other side everything they need to facilitate a proper decision. 
a decision to consider whether to settle in in the terms that are being proposed yeah um It'll be prepared to give uh, to give in to agree to the opponents when they are right, not not as if they, if you want to maintain the militant hardline approach of remaining where you are. That is not the, the exercise. More often than not, you just go there and they realize uh, they, they 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 don't have this explanation given to them, so they're not participating in in having those uh, things at the back of their mind, you know. So those are a few things in so far as um, uh, padding your client is concerned. There are quite a few others, but uh, don't think we have time to go into all of that, unfortunately. Comprehensive assessment paper, I've touched on that earlier already. It's uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's just a dossier docket that you ought to have with yourself. Again, this is a checklist of how you should do things. Uh, in a comprehensive manner to enhance the prospects of the mediation, not compulsory. Some of them, more of them, more often than not, and again, it goes into a mindset issue. They feel that there is no necessity to waste time in something like this. We all know where it stands. Uh, so what is the necessity for that? Uh, yeah, well, it can continue going on that way, but eventually, um, should you want to take a step back and say, I want to always give mediation, um, uh, chart. Uh, this should be something which is part of the checklist. Next thing, um, mandate settlement authority. Now, uh, this is a, a very uh, key aspect of why mediations always almost fail. Uh, more often than not, when you find it, when it comes to commercial parties, companies, uh, a person showing up because they all have made up everyone has made up lawyers have made up their mind parties have made up their mind that this is going to be a futile process they send a person who is a mere representative mere employee no mandate no authority to make any decision uh, so if you are you happen to be the lawyer to um, uh, and some even have uh, the other kind of problem which is limited authority so all of this ought to be addressed from the onset. If you are the type of uh, lawyer or you are, or your, your client is uh, wanting to give mediation a serious go, this ought to be addressed uh, at the very onset from the mediation process, even before, in fact, going into that, reaching out to the opposing counsel, put it in writing so far as saying that the person coming should have the mandate to get uh, uh, to the mandate for decision-making. There are ways around that. Uh, more often than not, sometimes practicality uh, will feature to say it's not easy to get someone with mandate, depending sometimes when it comes to institutional clients, for example. That is fine. There are uh, alternatives. There must be uh, a position or, uh, or a compromise or an agreement that the person who has the mandate to, to uh, settle uh, is on standby uh, in form at the very least, because technology is at that stage now, uh, to, to discuss and uh, give instructions as such. This is a very, very key aspect and lawyers sometimes go in without, so that again goes into the, the display that if you had not bothered about asking the question whether the other side is coming with someone who has mandate, it just shows that you have not given uh, mediation any uh, serious thought, you know, not giving it a chance at all. Uh, and that not, ought not to be something which is encouraged, an attitude which we must do away with. Um, disputes, uh, the, the, the characteristics of disputes, the um, pattern of disputes uh, as a whole uh, across the globe, it's metamorphosizing with technology uh, and, and mediation should feature in that evolution process uh, in a way uh, that is even more attention than it, it currently has. Um, then we go on to the joint session. I, I say uh, purposeful, genuine posturing during the joint session. Well, the only key uh, real takeaway in so far is I use the word purposeful, genuine posturing because more often than not, as lawyers, we, we posture, we posture with the uh, strategy and, and it comes across as intense, brash, uh, brazen, boisterous. 
uh, that that so posturing generally has that ascribed to it. But here, the purposeful, genuine posturing, uh, and I have mentioned earlier that you are actually trying and seeking to convince the other side. You're not actually convincing anyone else but the other side. So purposeful and genuine posturing from a lawyer here, this one, not even, not even from the client at all, it's from a lawyer, is, uh, is because the joint session is the only time really, even if you look at the adversarial process, in which uh, there ought to be, there are instances uh, in which you could directly communicate with the with the litigant of the other side. So that opportunity ought to be used uh, in line with objective for uh, achieving a settlement. Because you know things that the client doesn't know, maybe you did not want to say it, uh, 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 maybe you did not want to, to articulate something in a particular way, but that opportunity is given to you during the joint session. And you know that if you said a few things, sometimes our experience allows us to, to have that foresight. You knew if you could uh, say this directly to the other side, because both parties are, are attached uh, to the dispute in that emotional way they are, or engaged in and as such because of personalities. If you could relate in that way, and you knew that that had prospects, you should do that. That is the opportunity should, we should be uh, seized in, during the joint session. Promptly moving into negotiation, well, um, what is the, 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 the point, underlying point in so far as promptly moving into negotiation is concerning? Um, people tend to go into wanting to narrate their, their story, and that involves the factual narration. But more often than not, the facts are what is in dispute. So what you ought to do as a lawyer is like cause for the movement into the negotiation involving resolution. That will be more issue centric. So when it is issue centric, it just tends to be like, OK, what do what does the what does what uh, do parties want out of this whole thing? So that's why that is another art as well. And finally, avoiding the bottom line approach. The bottom line approach is always, you know, uh, uh, again, because of mindset issues. Like, hey, what is your bottom line? What is your bottom line? Always very far away. You're not going to bring parties. You have to bring parties closer to each other, right? So uh, pretty self-explanatory as well. Sometimes some, some lawyers, some mediators tend to want to extract that out of uh, parties to say, what is the bottom line? Uh, that is, uh, when when one goes deeply into mediation, uh, reading ADR, reading especially mediation, uh, the more experienced mediators will tell you to avoid the bottom line approach at all costs, because that just means that you are not genuinely giving uh, mediation a chance. Okay, that is about uh, what we have uh, in so far as how do lawyers um, enhance the prospects of uh, mediation. Now, moving forward, moving forward, uh, how uh, we can uh, adopt, embrace a, a, a more uh, purposeful uh, pro, uh, purposeful attitude. Yeah. So it goes back to that key word, attitude. Lawyers as a whole, from our training, from, from the day that, that we signed up to want to be a lawyer, one would realize that there is no uh, real training. There is no meaningful training in so far as uh, understanding mediation is concerned. We are trained in a mindset which is very inclined towards adversarial perspectives. You know, so we have to. There must be meaningful efforts in increasing the awareness of non-adversarial perspectives. This is one of it. Mediation, right? So we have to develop a culture of mediating amongst litigants. You don't find lawyers talking in a group saying that or, or affording any um, praise for a person uh, who, who has a pattern of successfully mediating matters. In fact, there are other perceptions which is leveled upon people who successfully mediate matters. That is unfortunate. It ought to be the case that uh, it, the, the, the outcome of mediating and, and, and settling a matter is more praiseworthy than otherwise. 
reshaping the mindsets and approach of lawyers towards mediation. This goes towards having, uh, at some point, some form of compulsory uh, training uh, of mediation in a, in a serious way, as, as just as how we have spoke about it, uh, to, to attack that mindset problem. So there we are, that, that would be my concluding remarks in so far as uh, you know, prospects to enhance uh, law prospects, lawyers, how, how can we as lawyers enhance the prospects of mediation? Um, I am ready to take questions, Kenny. Uh, okay, great. Uh, first and foremost, thank you Rishi for the wonderful insights. I'm pretty sure everyone, including myself, uh, have learned a thing or two from all of your insights. Uh, very quickly, we just jumped to question number one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the question goes, uh, hi, Mr. Rishi, may I know what kind of claims can be mediated? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, rather broad, open-ended question, but uh, you have a, a range of disputes which can be uh, mediated. Uh, contractual, commercial disputes generally can be mediated. Employment disputes can be mediated. Family disputes, I'm, I'm talking about me, uh, disputes which are popular, uh, popularly mediated. Family disputes, matrimonial disputes, uh, disputes involving personal injury, property damage, tortious acts as well, they, can be, they could be mediated. There are few which, which can't be mediated. You know, of course, needless to say, in any form of criminal prosecution uh, cannot be mediated. Um, uh, judicial review matters, public public law matters, uh, you know, public law relief when you're seeking for that, that can't be uh, mediated. So I hope I hope that gives uh, understanding of what are the kind of matters which can be mediated. Claim which can be mediated. Okay, uh, thanks Rishi. Uh, questions are coming in thick and fast. Uh, let's quickly go through them. Uh, second question, also from anonymous attendee. Uh, since mediation is voluntary, are there any repercussions to declining an invitation to mediation? In Malaysia, no. And that is another uh, unfortunate uh, circumstance. Um, and, and I can give a, a comparative analysis of, of what sort of uh, uh, repercussions that could present itself. Uh, in somewhere like UK. So UK, it's very simple. The confidential aspect in so far as what happens during a mediation remains. That can't change. Yes, of course, you know, otherwise no one would want to participate. In fact, that, that it will defeat the purpose of having mediation at all. But while that is confidential, once a judge uh, decides on the matter, uh, they have already, say you, you, uh, did not participate in a meaningful way. Uh, you were given offers uh, during the mediation. You uh, deliberately refused. You were difficult. You went ahead because you felt your prospects were high. You went ahead with litigation. Once uh, the judge decides, and if the judge decides in your favor, uh, assuming the judge awarded you 100,000 uh, pounds, um, but you were offered, uh, you were offered 150,000 or 200,000 during mediation. You know, uh, it will be the case that there will be cost consequences, if adverse co cost consequences to yourself for failing to um, obtain, or sorry, for failing to, to, to accept the, the better offer. So there are risks in that regard. Not in Malaysia though. Great. Uh, thanks, Rishi. Uh, next question from Amira Zati. Uh, she has a question regarding how it was mentioned earlier that the benefit of mediation is that there is no right or wrong application of the law. Uh, in this case, uh, what then would be the role of the law during mediation? Uh, thank you in advance. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, good question. Uh, the role of the law, again, uh, is for purposes of convincing the other side insofar as uh, where you stand 
in 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 so far as the prospects of the matter is concerned you know you would use facts in your favor you would also use the law in your favor in so far as trying to convince the other side when you are trying to convince the other side uh, we are making the assumption that the other side has uh, a lawyer in 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 the presence uh, of that party um, otherwise uh, it, uh, mediation tends to be rather focused on the facts Okay, great. I think that that would be the straightforward answer. Uh, next question from uh, Zafira Shamsuddin. Uh, what about mediation cost of fees? Who shall bear the fees? Is it sh to be shared by both parties? Okay, um, uh, good question. Now, that, to answer that question, you must first understand whether it's a privately uh, mediation brought about by private parties you know in which case then you would have to go uh, and uh, assess either there is a mutual agreement on what is the position in so far as who bears costs uh, that ought to be the case because that would be a, a, a proposition based mediation if it is a mediation based on a clause arising out of a contract that would have normally been spelled out in the contract who bears the costs but if your question is, and I suspect it may be, um, if it is in relation to uh, court ordered mediation, there are no cost consequences. There, are, there is no issue of costs. No party has to bear any cost. It is a free service provided by the Malaysian Mediation Center. Okay, I think that also answers the question. Uh, next question by uh, Qian. Uh, can the mediation be terminated? Yes, uh, very simply under section 11 sub 3 of the Mediation Act, uh, one will note that a mediator can end the mediation if further efforts at the mediation would not contribute to a satisfactory uh, resolution. All right, uh, next question, um, also from an anonym, anonymous attendee. If there are so many benefits that come with mediation, why are people or entities reluctant to mediate? Well, um, I would go with just uh, one very pernicious or prominent uh, factor, and that is uh, an absolute lack of awareness of the benefits of uh, mediation. And this is where I say lawyers uh, do not do enough in so far as creating that awareness with commercial uh, parties or disputes, uh, well, disputants are concerned. That is one aspect of it, uh, why mediation, uh, you know, uh, and, and people are not opting for mediation. The other aspect would be um, the simple uh, fact that when, uh, when parties are, uh, they, they, they are very real disputes, more often than not, parties are at loggerheads with each other. Uh, and that is why sometimes as lawyers, we feel that we know that there are no prospects for mediation. So while I said whatever I said earlier during my talk, it's not as if I am not uh, uh, aware of the practicalities of, uh, of a dispute, of where parties are stood at. You see, so de depending on that, the nature of the dispute, um, it, there are matters which simply, you know, it is it, there is no real prospect of trying to mediate. So take that factor into account, uh, parties being emotionally invested in their dispute, uh, this, this would serve as one of the other prominent reasons why people don't opt for mediation. It is not as attractive at that point in time because a party in emotionally invested in a dispute would want an all or nothing uh, outcome. They want an all or nothing for themselves. If the person is defending that they want an all or nothing, that means they don't want to pay a single cent. So when both parties are juxtaposed that way, uh, no one is likely to, to want to give mediation a, a go. Okay, uh, we have reached the end of our talk, but I think Rishi, perhaps we can just address one last question. Uh, I think it's a, it's a compound, uh, that question, uh, but 
by Ms. Joy Rama uh, or Mr. I'm not too sure. Uh, in what circumstances will a court order a mediation? Uh, if there is a contractual provision to mediate, can parties ignore this provision and move to arbitration or to court ignoring mediation? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, in what I circumstances? Hi, Mr. Joy Rama, how are you? I think I asked you, we spoke before. Yeah. Okay, I think the question, uh, I think, focuses on whether parties can ignore a contractual provision to mediate and will the court order mediation in, in this kind of situation? Uh, parties, are, it is very difficult to ignore uh, a contractual uh, uh, clause mandating for mediation. You have to at least go through the, uh, the process. But whether they meaningfully participate, that would be a separate thing altogether. What parties more often than not do is they, they participate, but they, they just go through the motions and in their head, they're actually not giving any uh, chance or prospect for it. That they are entitled to do. Unfortunately, that they are, that they, can, they can go unscathed. Uh, no one can ask anything. No one can question any, the premise of their decision at all, um, at any point. And that is the law in Malaysia. All right. I, I think with that, uh, yeah, I think I think it does. Uh, call, think it does. Uh, sorry, that, yeah. the second part of the question is the, yeah, court sure. can uh, order, the court can order mediation. Even if the mediation has failed once, the court can order another mediation. The court has done so in, in a few of the matters that I have done um, in a meaningful way. Say, do you want a particular judge? They gave us the option. We, we chose a particular judge of their background. And that's why I spoke about choice of mediator earlier. And that judge actually, uh, while the first mediation went on, um, while it was so obvious that they came, they just wanted to just run through the motions and not give the mediation a go. The second time around, uh, it was not as easy. Still a failed mediation, but it was not as easy. And again, there were key takeaways from that mediation, which gave parties a, a clear understanding where we are stood at, what is the the the, the, the tipping point of the dispute, which can't be dealt with, can't be addressed, we have to go to litigation, for example. All right, that's all. Great, um, I think that uh, answers uh, conclusively, I think the last question, series of questions uh, by our participant. I think with that, uh, this ends our RDS Thursday webinar session today. Um, thank you, Rishi, for all the wonderful insights and um, have a great Thursday, everyone. Most welcome. Goodbye. Thank you, Kenny, for moderating. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for right. participating. Look forward to see you all in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.